Hi, and welcome to Harvest Bible Chapel, Kuala Lumpur Online. We hope that the following message will be a blessing to you as you seek to walk with the Lord in spirit and in truth. For more information about our church, please visit www.harvestkl.org or click the link in the description below. Well, it's good to be uh, here with you again. My name is Troy, uh, and once again, I have the privilege of sharing God's Word with you today. We as a church are going through the Sermon on the Mount, and we continue. Um, The Sermon on the Mount is found in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, and we are still in chapter 5, but we're getting close to the end. We're getting there. Um, Last week, we explored how the Sermon on the Mount drives to the essence of God his kingdom, and the law, and that in these sometimes difficult uh, to understand passages, Jesus is revealing the essence of God, his kingdom, and the law to those who have eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to understand. And that led us to a lengthy look at the concept of form and essence. I'll pause for a second, let's get caught up. And so uh, we talked about form and essence, and we actually had three themes last week, and they were one, form and essence, two, spiritual maturity, and three, the practical application that results in godly living. We will see these three uh, themes again today, but they will not be highlighted and explained like they were last week, but if you're on the lookout for them, you will see them. So let's... uh, Go to our passage today, Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 to 42. And so we read, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. Whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks of you, and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. Now, this is the fourth week in a row that we hear Jesus say, you have heard that it was said, but I say to you. Now, we heard this with murder and anger. We heard this with adultery and lust. We heard this with false vows and the genuine yeses and nos. And now we hear it again. And it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And so far, each time, Jesus has been referring back to the Ten Commandments, specifically to the section of the commands are on loving others. And then he would expand upon them. So for those of you who are here last week, you probably already know what our goal is today. Okay, we talked a lot about it last week. So we're, we want to understand the form and the essence of this Old Testament command that Jesus quotes. And then to ultimately understand the essence of Jesus's message here in the Sermon on the Mount, and then to try and understand any resulting forms he suggests as applications. So to reach that goal, we've got to go back to the Old Testament command, and we actually find this one in three different passages. So the first is Exodus 21. It says, if men struggle with each other and strike a woman with child so that she gives birth prematurely, yet there is no injury, he shall surely be fined as the woman's husband may demand of him, and he shall pay as the judges decide. But if there is any further injury, then you shall appoint a penalty, life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. Burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise for bruise. And then again in Leviticus 24, we read, If a man takes the life of any human being, he shall surely be put to death. The one who takes the life of an animal shall make it good, life for life. If a man injures his neighbor, just as he has done, so it shall be done to him. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, just as he has injured a man, so it shall be inflicted on him. And then the last is in Deuteronomy 19. If a malicious witness rises up against a man to accuse him of wrongdoing, the judges shall investigate thoroughly 
And if the witness is a false witness and he has accused his brother falsely, then you shall do to him just as he is intended to do to his brother. Thus you shall not show pity, life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. Now, this is actually a very well-known principle adopted by many ancient societies and up through the early Roman law, and it's called lex talionis, the law of retribution. And it is where the penalty must match the nature and severity of the offense. It's about proportional justice. And overall, it deals with the issue of vengeance. Now, what do we notice from these three passages? We see that judges are involved and they determine a penalty or a punishment. That penalty is to be carried out on the person who caused the injury. These are in the context of a court of law and they are personal in nature. So what we are dealing with are personal matters before courts of law where punishment is decided and carried out by the judges, the officials, or the courts. This is not some renegade, everyone for themselves, retribution. So in fact, we should even note that Exodus 21, which we previously read, comes right after the 10 commandments in Exodus 20. Verse one of Exodus 21 reads, now these are the ordinances which you are to set before them. And what is an ordinance? It's an authoritative decree. In our context, these are the laws or commands God is giving Moses for the Israelites to implement and obey. So we see that the Old Testament law actually made provision for vengeance, but the retaliation was provided under the authority of a legal court before judges, decided by judges, and the law's intent was to control vengeance and limit retaliation, limit the revenge. It was about maintaining proper justice. But like we saw last week, was there a more important essence that, could, that they could have learned that went beyond the form of the law handed to them? And yes, there was. Remember this slide from last week. It was the Ten Commandments. Let's see if we can catch up to it. So we had this last week. And in the bottom right corner, we have Leviticus 19.18. And it reads, you shall not take vengeance, nor bear any grudge against the sons of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So yes, just like last week, there are plenty of verses in the Old Testament that they could have seen the essence that went beyond just the form that they were given. And there are many other verses if we move on. And they could have learned this, that there's something better than just limiting vengeance or retribution, that there was a better way. And it was simply not to take any vengeance at all and just leave it to the Lord. And so in Leviticus 19, we see, you shall not take vengeance. In Deuteronomy 13, it says, vengeance is mine and retribution. The entire Psalm 94 is a Psalm asking God to take vengeance. Oh Lord, God of vengeance, shine forth, rise up. And then in the Proverbs, we even read, do not say, I will repay evil. Wait for the Lord. It also says, do not say, thus I shall do to him as he has done to me. Exactly what this Lex Talionis was about. And so we see that there were plenty of ways that they could have seen that there was something greater. So Lex Talionis was just. It was just, but it did not get to the very essence of God. Let's go back to our passage in Matthew where we can explore what Jesus makes of all of this. So Jesus says, but I say to you, do not resist an evil person. So Jesus's response to just retribution is that no retribution is needed at all. In fact, when you consider the essence of God, his kingdom and the law, Jesus simply says, do not resist an evil person. What does this mean? Well, first in our context, it means do not counter, do not fight back, do not retaliate or seek retribution. But secondly, it means allow it to happen. And after it does, stay engaged. Now, Jesus explains all of this with his own forms that come in four examples. So let's look at the first. He says, but whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. So if you think about the right hand, which would be used to make the slap, hitting the right cheek, then we see that this is a backhanded slap. Now, 
I'm sorry to use you in this illustration, but since we're facing each other face to face here, consider my right hand and now consider your right cheek. If I do this, which cheek will I hit? I hit your left. But if I do this with a backhanded slap, I'll hit your right cheek. This backhanded slap was an act of humiliation and not one of attack. It was intended as an insult. This was not like punching or hitting like we might think. There was rabbinical teaching that a backhanded slap was a double insult that resulted in a fine that was double that of an open-handed slap. And it's very likely that this is to be understood in a religious context. It could illustrate being publicly rejected from the synagogue. Remember, the previous passages on vows was about the religious leaders. We went into this detail last week. We read how Jesus even called those leaders evil and how they falsely vowed through what they thought were sneaky ways to be dishonest and still uphold the law. And Jesus is now saying, do not resist the evil person. And his first example fits with yet another way the religious leaders abused their power and authority. And what are we told? If we are insulted and humiliated in this way, we should not only stand and take it, but turn back to our abuser and be ready for another. Now we'll move on to our second example. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. The context here is a legal court setting. And because this is Israel, that means a religious setting. Okay, the law was religious. And we can understand the setting by looking at Exodus 22. And it says in Exodus 22, if you lend money to my people, to the poor among you, you are not to act as a creditor to him. You shall not charge him interest. If you ever take your neighbor's cloak as a pledge, you are to return it to him before the sun sets. For that is his only covering. It is his cloak for his body. What else shall he sleep in? And it shall come about that when he cries out to me, I will hear him, for I am gracious. And then again in Deuteronomy 24, it says, When you make your neighbor a loan of any sort, you shall not enter his house to take his pledge. You shall remain outside, and the man to whom you make the loan shall bring the pledge out to you. If he is a poor man, you shall not sleep with his pledge. When the sun goes down, you shall surely return the pledge to him, that he may sleep in his cloak and bless you and it will be righteousness for you before the Lord your God. So there's two key words that we have to understand here. In the NASB translation that I'm showing, the Matthew passage uses the word shirt and coat. Your Bible may talk about a tunic or cloak or something different. Okay, and in the two Old Testament passages, we do see the word cloak. So what we're dealing with here is an undergarment, okay? An undergarment that went against your skin, and then an outer garment that was worn over the undergarment, okay? So whether it's tunic or cloak or shirt, or all the different coat or all the translations, we're just gonna talk about undergarment and outer garment. So in Matthew, the undergarment is called a shirt and the outer garment is called a coat. And the Old Testament passage called it a cloak. We'll just set those terms aside. So what the Old Testament passages teaches us is that it was unlawful to take the outer garment as a pledge or as security or as a collateral for this loan. Why? Because if a person was giving you their outer garment as a pledge, it meant they were poor. They had nothing else of value to put up as a pledge. And as a poor person, the outer garment would be essential to their well-being, as it would be what they wrapped themselves in at night to stay warm. As a result, a poor person might give an undergarment as a pledge, since it is conceivable they might have two of those. The undergarment was far less costly or valuable than the outer garment. You know, just as a side, because of the, what I heard just a short uh, while ago um, in the reading, it, to better understand this, you could even think of Jesus. Okay, so it's Palm Sunday, we're getting closer to the cross and to the resurrection. But when he was on the cross, they divided his clothes. And so the outer garments, they split up among each other. And then if you remember, it says that the undergarment, there was one seamless piece. And so they cast lots for it because they didn't want to rip it up, but they couldn't even rip it up. But this was the common dress, and um, this is what they're, uh, they're talking about here. Now, in the, in the example Jesus is giving, uh, the lender is suing the borrower 
And though he has a right to claim the undergarment that was given as a pledge, it appears he is going after the outer garment as well. And Jesus is saying that the borrower or the defendant in court here should be prepared to let him have his outer garment as well. Now, amidst all these understanding of garments, do not miss that this is extreme. In the Bible, being naked can be referred to having no undergarment on or just only having an undergarment on where your outer garment has been taken away. So in this scenario, it would appear the claimant already has one of the defendant's undergarments, and now he's trying to take the outer garment, and the defendant would be left only with his undergarment, which means he is left naked according to his culture as it would be defined. So this is yet another example of true humiliation. Now, these are tough words from Jesus, and this is just the beginning of what we'll see more of in chapter 6 in the Sermon on the Mount, when we read in verse 25, For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? The Sermon on the Mount truly gives us some radical teachings to not be concerned about the most basic necessities of life and to even be willing to give up unjustly? Yes, this is extreme. Let's move on to our third example. Whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Now, first, I want to make a distinction. This is not about, say, someone going to Lee, our resident ultramarathoner here at the church, and saying, hey, jog with me one mile. Because we all know that Lee, you know, he'd get all excited. He'd be like, hey, buddy, let's go run 50. No, this is not it, okay? This is actually another example of humiliation, okay? Roman law allowed for a soldier to conscript or force a person to carry his gear. This was actually an ancient practice of many armies, okay, where conscripting peasants was common. So Jesus says if a soldier forces you to go one mile, then carry his gear an additional mile. When people exercise their authority over you to humiliate you, to belittle you, take advantage of you, or just to remind you of your place in life, do not feel humiliation, but willingly serve them. You're probably reminded of Simon of Cyrene, who was forced by the Roman soldiers to carry Jesus's cross, an innocent bystander who shared in the insult and humiliation of the cross of Christ. This is what powerful people can do and will do. And Jesus says, do not resist the evil person. If he forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Now on to our fourth example. He says, give to him who asks of you and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. The context here is, like, is likely almsgiving which was held highly in the ancient world. And the biblical context is about meeting legitimate basic needs like food and shelter and clothing. So whether beggars or borrowers, the poor are in picture here and their needs are real. Jesus says to give to the poor when they ask and do not reject them when they want to borrow from you. So to summarize, Jesus' enhancement to just retribution to this lex talionis in light of seeing the true essence of God is, do not resist an evil person. Then he gives four examples or illustrations or forms to follow. And these new commands are not easy to accept. They are radical and purposely extreme. They shock any listener. They remind us of how far we are from the true essence of God, his kingdom and the law. But they are also a true reflection of God and therefore real. They're impossible to keep perfectly, but they remain as the standard to which we strive. We are not to ignore them as unattainable, but accept them as the accurate reflection of God that we are being transformed into. By faith, we try to live by them. And since these fall under a section of commands about loving others, that is what we must do. Earlier, I stated that part of not resisting an evil person is staying engaged. Turning your head back and offering your other cheek for an open-handed slap illustrates that. It means you can forgive a wrong against you 
and re-engage a person to whom you are vulnerable to repeated abuse and humiliation. Love exposes you and makes you vulnerable. And when a person of authority forces you to serve them, you're going the extra mile is your engagement. Something you can only do if you are not bitter about the first mile. And we have already read, it's about not taking vengeance. It's about not holding grudges. It's about not being bitter. It's about forgiveness and love. And if we consider Luke's sermon on the plane from which Bethany read earlier in our scripture reading, we see that in the case where someone takes your outer garment away, you are not to withhold your undergarment from him. Now, these garments are in reverse order in Luke than they are for Matthew. Why? Because Luke's context is completely different. Matthew's was a legal court. Luke's is a robbery. Okay? So robbers were found on the highways that had to be taken when you traveled from city to city. And a very practical application to the disciples listening to Jesus was basically about missionary travel, going off to do the ministry that he would send them to do. If you were robbed, they would naturally take your outer garment, which was easier to take and more valuable. But Jesus says, don't prevent them from taking more. Give them your undergarment too. So the question of engagement in Luke would concern whether or not you would travel that road again for ministry. Could you accept your suffering and loss and turn back again so that you could love and serve your neighbor? Not resisting an evil person is radical. And re-engaging them might seem insane. But as we saw last week, we must process such radical statements with spiritual maturity. I hope someone here was a bit concerned when earlier I stated that to not resist means you need to allow it to happen. Are we, allow, are we to allow any and all evil to, it ha to happen? Of course not. Let's look at a passage from Deuteronomy 22. If there is a girl who is a virgin engaged to a man, and another man finds her in the city and lies with her, then you shall bring them both out to the gate of the city, and you shall stone them to death. The girl, because she did not cry out in the city, and the man, because he has violated his neighbor's wife. Thus, you shall purge the evil from among you. But if in the field the man finds the girl who is engaged, and the man forces her to lie with her, then only the man who lies with her shall die. But you shall do nothing to the girl. There is no sin in the girl worthy of death. For just as a man rises against his neighbor and murders him, so is this case. When he found her in the field, the engaged girl cried out, but there was no one to save her. So here, the girl clearly had a responsibility to do what? To scream and to resist. If she doesn't, then she too is guilty. Just allowing the injustice to happen is not the right thing to do here. This context is quite different from the examples Jesus just shared. And we cannot make the error of holding so firmly to the forms Jesus presents that we lose sight of the essence of God and all the other truths we know about him. That's where we've started with all this. Jesus is pointing to the forms of the Old Testament where the religious leaders held onto them so strictly that they lost perspective. And now when Jesus teaches us the essence and gives us new forms, we still must have wisdom and we must consider all the truths that God has given us. So how you will choose to live out today's passage requires great wisdom. And to what extent, or should I say, to what extreme these forms will be held in your life will be according to the faith and wisdom you possess. And as we contemplate and struggle to have faith and the wisdom to live in such a way as Jesus asks, we must hold on to the core message here. What kind of people can hum humiliate you? The first three examples Jesus gives of non-resistance and non-retaliation are about humility. What kind of people have power and authority over you? The obvious and all too common categories are the rich and the politically powerful. And when I say the politically powerful, I extend that to anyone who derives power from any government or institutional relationship. This would include soldiers and even tax collectors. Now there are others who may have power and authority over us, like our managers at work, or maybe a coach in sports. But there are ways to move out from under these authorities by simply resigning from our position under them. 
But with the rich and the politically powerful, there is oftentimes no escape. And in the Jewish context of our passage, religious leaders fall into the category of the politically powerful. So whether you are disrespectfully slapped by a religious leader, sued by the rich, or conscripted by a soldier to serve him, you can stand in humiliation. And I say stand because you can stand proudly as a follower of Christ and do the very things that Jesus himself did. You do not have to cower in humiliation, shrink back in fear, be brought low to the ground. No, you can stand tall and do the best you can possibly do to love others as Jesus commands. That is why I titled the sermon Standing in Humility. The world will see you as weak and humiliated, but God will see you as strong and one who is proud to suffer for his name's sake. Remember how we started the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit, who mourn, who are gentle, who are peacemakers, who are persecuted. Blessed, not humiliated, blessed. And for what? 511 says, for your reward in heaven is great. But what about the fourth example? Whoever asks of you or wants to borrow from you. In this example, you are the person of power. What then will you do? Well, from your standing position as a proud servant of God, you will bend down. You will bend over and help meet the real need before you. In all four cases, you will be humble. You can stand in humiliation and you can bend down in humility. And the more often that you set aside retaliation and you stand in humility, experiencing all that comes with that while forgiving and loving, then the more often and the easier it will be to bend in humility when asked. Now, I'm going to take it aside here right quick because I didn't prepare this, but on the way over, I just remembered this story. And this is the positive side of that you can do this, you can stand in humility, and the more you experience it, then you can bend. But there is a negative side. And I lived in a culture um, where the values were messed up at times. And I would often joke about how basically it would start at the top of the authority and someone way high up, let's say a company, would kick their subordinate. And I use the word kick, you know, as abuse. And then he would go find his subordinate and kick them. And then they would go find their subordinate and kick them. And they would go all the way down. And then finally, whoever it was would go home and they would go find their spouse and they would kick them. And then the spouse would find their child and they would kick them. And then the child would go find the dog and kick the dog. And then the dog would find the cat and bite the cat. And then the cat would eat the rat. And that's the way the culture was. And it was fine because everyone got to like vent their frustration and only the rat got eaten and nobody likes rats, right? So it was perfectly justified, okay? So I was thinking of that on the way over here. And, and then in that same culture, I was newer. I was a bit, you know, I guess naive and ignorant, but I had my car parked in like here, high rises, and someone was doing construction at the top and they dropped like wet cement all over my car. So I go marching up and like trying to find out what's going on and be like, hey, this like this isn't, you know, too cool here, you know, dropping wet semen over my car and everything. And I, just the most crazy, amazing thing, and I say amazing in a bad way, happened that these workers were up there and I lodged my complaint and they grabbed some boy that was like 11 or 12 years old and put him in front of me and said, hit him. I mean, I was so like not in the right mindset. Well, I, I just couldn't figure out what was going on. Now, as I lived there longer, I, I kind of understood these things, but they literally thought that that was going to make everything okay. Okay, so we threw semen on your car. Oh, well, you suffered. Hit the boy. Now, he didn't say, come hit me. I mean, you know, the, the man, he threw out a little boy. And I was just like befuddled. I mean, I was like, what in the world? And so, yes, as believers... As we practice, you know, being humble and receiving it, hopefully we will be compassionate enough to extend it. But at the same time, we have to warn against just thinking we need to pass it on. Hey, I had a bad day. Someone else has to have a bad day. Someone's being mean to me. I just need to go be mean to someone else. And this is real. 
And I've lived it to an extreme, not even understanding how I could get to that kind of extreme. So as hard as, uh, as, hard as all of this is, um, you know, we haven't arrived at Jesus' last, but I say to you, um, let me make sure I just back to what I said. Um, and so I don't know if it's uh, our next uh, sermon is going to be uh, about him calling us. And when he says, but I say to you, calling us to even love our enemies, okay, which is going to be the climax of this progression of all these, you've heard it said, but I say to you, and it's going to end this climax and actually end chapter five um, in, our, in the portion of the Sermon on the Mount. But so the Sermon on the Mount is life-changing. For those of you who have eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to understand, we emphasized this a lot last week. And I pray that God will give you eyes to see the essence of God, his kingdom, and the law. This is a crucial first step, okay? It's the first step. But you and I will not even come close to living out these impossible commands of Jesus unless we know that God sees us. We need to see him, but we need to know that he sees us. Why would we do this? What kind of values or worldview would we have to have to try and live a life like this? Well, one that believes God loves us, believes that he sees us, that will always provide for us, and that he will ultimately bring justice and reward for those who trust in him to do good works as he has asked us to do. So yes, see God, but confidently know that God sees you. That is what will sustain you.